We've got an absolutely loaded show today talking to a new Notre Dame commitment with a last name that you guys might be pretty familiar with. We're going to bring on Tyler Horka to talk about Notre Dame spring football with the Irish having their second practice today and then some quarterback recruiting. We're going to discuss that here at the top of the show uh, with uh, with your boy here uh, logging a prediction for Notre Dame in the 2026 class at the position uh, and uh, Tim is going to give his thoughts, and we'll talk about the quarterback board a little bit. Uh, usually, I'm just so happy to talk to Tim Hyde, but uh, I've been texting with him and Goolsby in our infamous group chat today. So uh, Tim's been ticking me off a little bit. So I'm not, you know, yeah, you haven't been in. Yeah, that's, that's right. I'm not trying to give Tim a hug right now, but uh, oh, it, it is good to see you. Yeah, I was going to say you haven't been in. You haven't been in the little our night chats lately, as we've been watching a lot of football. So. And, um, and roll from there. Speaking of football, I know we always jump right into whatever, whatever, you know, the hot news of the day, man. I am, I don't have any life after 10 p.m. pretty much. That's like kind of my, my downtime. That's, that's my Tim Hyde moment. Mike, I have been sucking up so much football. I just can't, I can't wait. I've been diving into, I know I called it the cupcake schedule and people don't like that and whatnot, but AM. FSU. Oh my God, it's going to be awesome. So I am uh, counting down for those games. The Florida State game, they, they sound like they're absolutely freaking loaded. So really excited about that. Just been getting, I've been diving into a bunch of podcasts lately, late at night. You know me and Dishes. So been been getting excited. And speaking of, that, speaking of that, I know we always talk about national news lately. I guess the hot topics, a garage sale, I guess, has been going on. And yeah, picture of Jim Harbaugh apparently having a garage. Uh, just so I weird. It. Just I so. It. No, I do love the, I, I love the conversations uh, that that we dive into at times. So it's uh, we're 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 dying we're dying for Notre Dame football news. That's pretty much it. Yeah, when you, when you start breaking when you start breaking down garage shells. We need some football. Yeah, that Caden Proctor. I mean, oh, Caden yeah. Proctor. Yes. leaving Alabama to go to Iowa to go back to, to Alabama. Just absolutely absurd. I, I've said this several times, Tim, but Notre Dame stealing Mike Denbrock from Brian Kelly and LSU in a lateral move, offense coordinator, offense coordinator. That is That should be bigger news than it has been. I mean, that is probably like the 98th biggest news item from this. This has been... By far the most bonkers off season in college football history. Um, there, you're, there's just no chance in hell you're going to convince me of anything otherwise. It has been non freaking st- Nick Saban retired. I mean, come on, it, it's been he's it's been 72. Crazy. It's like you know, it's like, you know, all, all the I know he was in the news recently. People are complaining about his little comments at the Senate hearing and all that. I'm like. Got 72 years old. He's been coaching football 50 years. I'm like, come on, he's done. It's yeah. like, move on. But he's yeah. so iconic. It's like, wow, he did retire. You, you are right about that. Yeah. He got lawsuits, the ACC. Clemson, yeah. Notre Dame. It's like, yeah, it, it's wild. It's wild. That's why I just get the football. This season is going to happen. Let's just see what in the heck is going to happen in 2024. Yeah. But um, we'll we get a 14-team playoff before we've even started the Dan 12 team. It, it's it's It really has been all over the place. Um, yeah, speaking yeah. of that, just do 14 this year for crying out loud. You tell me they can't get two teams in? It's like, come on. Come on. So dumb. It's like, Talk do about it. your point about the schedule real quick, Tim. That's why I, I push back on everyone saying it's a cup. It's not. I, I, there, oh, it is. It, there it is. is it, it is, Mike. It it, is. There's always a few games. You should play a few tough games for crying out loud. Yeah, but like, yeah, they, they there's a lot of easy teams, but it's not like a Boise State Mountain West where you know they're going 12 and 0. You know, well, they, well first you just talked Dame. about Florida State. Whoa, 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 whoa. You can't throw Notre Dame into the Mountain West for crying out loud. All right, Notre Dame. That's a cupcake schedule. Game. That's what I'm saying. Like, no, Notre Dame does not have a cupcake schedule. There are cupcakes on it, but. Dude, you're just talking about that loaded Florida State team. Come on, Tim. Back to back weeks. Hey, I hey, I kid you not, dude. I went to notifications and I said, "Do not allow." I, I so I literally just did that 12 minutes ago. Oh my god! Don't get me going here. It's all right. It's all right, John. Turn. John's in here saying it's easier than usual by far. I'll, I know. 
Yeah, no crap. But it's it's not – I just don't think you can call it a cupcake when you have Florida State. Um, in November. In, in USC. In November. Okay. Hold on. You got one at the beginning. Then Notre Dame doesn't leave the state of Indiana for like six weeks. So, Tim, is it – so, so, so – okay. So they you only go to you, you started the show by saying that, it, like, oh man, Texas A and M and Florida State and U.S. Oh, and and now it's a cupcake again. No, 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 no. You have to play tough games. You can't play twelve match schools for crying out loud. Okay, you I have to have some hard games. But there's no juggernauts back to back. There's no stretch. It is bam. Hey, you got nine months, Marcus Freeman, and your cohorts to prep for College Station. After that. You don't leave Indiana. I mean, everyone, look at the schedule. They don't leave Indiana for six weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. They're not. Okay. They're, they're not. They're, their hardest game in there is at Purdue. I think. I think they should be able to survive that. There's like, there's different levels to this. Cupcake is the bottom. Is the bottom of it. Easy is above it. I'll give you easy. You can't. You can't. You can't. You layer can't say cake. cupcake with those big layer three. Little, what is that? Pineapple upside down cake with the layers. Are we going to do that then? There's, dude. You just can't. All right. Let's get into the the meat right, potatoes let's of go. our show. Good stuff. Um, just such a joy to talk to you tonight. Oh, I'm hyped. <laughs> Brady. Okay. Again, folks, if you're just joining, uh, we have Jordan Faison, 2026 wide receiver, committed to Notre Dame on Monday. We'll be talking to him shortly, uh, and then Tyler Horka will be on after that. Tough act to follow there, Mr. Horka. Um, so we're going to have two guests. Uh, we haven't done that in a while, so back-to-back -back guests. Uh, some good stuff there. Um, so we're going to start talking a little 2026 quarterback recruiting. Of course, Notre Dame has 2025 um, done and dusted with Deuce Knight visiting. I believe he actually arrives to campus, or, or he lands in South Bend to, tonight, and then he'll be in uh, – you know, at Notre Dame through the weekend. And Notre Dame's already getting a head start on 2026. Um, Noah Grubb, we'll, we'll talk about the other quarterbacks in, in a moment, but I did log a prediction on Monday. I wanted to do a few predictions for Notre Dame in the 2026 class for a pot of gold. And I thought now's the time to pull the trigger on a prediction. Again, folks, I call them predictions. It's there. There's no crystal ball involved if you – put in a prediction for a recruit to end up at a school when you, you already damn well know they're going there and they already gave a silent commitment. So very much a prediction. Wanted to log this ahead of time. Um, I, I, I feel pretty good about this one. Uh, multiple sources believe that the Irish are the team to beat here. Uh, he, he hasn't visited campus yet, but he will do that uh, at the beginning of April. Uh, Notre Dame offered this state champion in the Sunshine State, which he's in high classification ball um, in Florida. So Notre Dame offered him back in December. Um, and I just hear really, really good things about how um, that has trended. Uh, and Notre Dame would be pretty darn excited to add him in the class. So 6'5", 185 pounds. Um, rankings are a little all over the board for him right now. Tom Lemming says he's a five star on three says three star rival says four star. So he kind of got, um, all over the board right now. Um, but you know, for the on three one, he, he is in the top two fifty. I, I, I think rankings as sophomores is kind of ridiculous, but I mean, the schools offer the kids this early. So I, I, I guess it does make sense to do them, but, um, yeah, projecting this one, I, I very much, Tim could see another quarterback, um, jumping him in line potentially, um, like we saw last year. You know, seemed like Bear Bachmeyer, you know, was going to trend towards Notre Dame, and what did Deuce Knight do? Jumped them in line. So we'll see uh, how this one ends up going. But wanted to pop up uh, Brady Hart's film and, and get your thoughts on him, Tim. Yeah, I mean, you're right. You're what you're watching a film for a guy who's 18 months away from signing day or whatever the heck it is. Correct. Uh, yeah, it's 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 wild, man. Every time we start talking about these guys, he's fun to watch. I mean, let's just be honest. All these quarterbacks are. I mean, we could go down the list. The six, what the six main ones Notre Dame's offered are outstanding. He's up there. Uh, he's, I mean, he's a blue chip. He's he's no three star quarterback at all. It's still early. The you know, especially when you're doing sophomores, like you're saying, it's way much better to offer these guys after you go through the you know spring evaluation, the summer camp circuits. Then you get a better understanding of these guys, but uh, he's good. I mean, he's going to be a national top 10 quarterback. I love the way he, one of, one of my favorite things, there's a couple passes where he just flips his hips, 
ball set, zings it right, you know, right on the money. He's very confident. That's one thing. When you watch this guy, it's so funny. I was taking notes, just trying to, I mean, arm talent, all that stuff's there. And then you just watch him as a quarterback and you're like, man, this is one confident 15 year old kid, basically yeah. playing as a sophomore out there. Very, very assured of where he wants to go with the ball. It, it feels like, like, well coached. I mean, you could tell. I mean, he reads. He knows how to look left, throw right, look right, throw left. You see that a lot. He doesn't stare at dudes, which is great. Um, really good. Like I said, hip flips the ball out. We were talking right before the show, man. He zings that thing right out of his hands. And then what I like to do, go back and look at past quarterbacks Notre Dame offered or committed as sophomores. He's a he's a bigger, faster, stronger CJ Carr as a sophomore. I, I I truly believe so. You know, when you look at him, compare him to where. Those guys were a sophomore, so um, he, he's, he's a nice quarterback, but as are every darn one yeah. they've offered. It's like, yeah. seriously, you flip a coin, give me one of the six, Notre Dame's happy as hell. This this clip right here, I know he's wearing 13, so that, that kind of makes the comparison even more, but I don't know, man. Kid looks like Carr for sure. He's He's got two, you know at least two inches on Carr. Yeah, uh, I think cars around six two, six three. His kids six, uh, you know, about six five. Uh, but yeah, so he's 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 lean right now. I mean, he's a he's a sophomore of guy, of course. Exactly. But six exactly. five, he moved like I am a okay. huge fan of Brady Hart, okay. and in the couple of times I've been able to talk to him on the phone, like it he it oh, okay, look at the okay okay all right, Brady didn't know you had that in you. When I talk to Brady Hart, I'm like, you're more mature than Tim Hyde. Like, that's what it feels like <laughs> when I'm talking to He's Brady. Nervous. So, He's nervous. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. So, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll see where it ends up trending. And, uh, Tim, I did no, I want agree, Mike. to – I did want to pop up this as well. I, I, I always love this kind of footage too, just like some, you know, good – Good quarterback camp. Yeah, well, Saturday yeah. afternoon. Yeah, Saturday morning. Fundamentals. Yeah, yeah. I saw. I saw some of this as well. The ball just zips out. I mean, look at that. That's just look at that throwing motion. Is just it's beautiful. I mean, it, it, it is. is. It's, it's the beautiful. ball just comes out with some force. It really. I don't does. know if that's part of the angle or anything, but I don't know. I'm a fan. I mean, I remember. I mean, and I'm only saying CJ Carr, obviously, because he's he's the newbie. You know. You know, we got into him and things of that nature. Um, Deuce Knight is athletic. You know, I've, I've seen a full game of Deuce where, you know, sometimes the ball could move around a bunch, you know, but he's so damn athletic. He's just going to keep growing and developing. When you see this guy, you're like, man, he's a sophomore, Mike. This guy has to play two more years of high school football, which is just yeah. crazy, right? He yeah. still has to play 25 more games or whatever the heck it's yeah. going to be. So you just already see where he's at now is and the way he's gonna. I mean, look at that ball just flies down the field. <laughs> look at these these last two where he just chucks it. Beautiful spiral. You could already see the ball. Uh, there's some plays on his sophomore film where it wobbles a little bit. It comes out a little wobbly. His footwork is beautiful and whatnot. But you see on that on, the, on that little uh, practice film, I mean, it's line drives already. So um, extremely extremely excited about him. Heck of an athlete. Yeah. yeah. I, I am in a complete agreement with you that whether it's Hart or Grubbs, and, and again, we're, we're, next we're going to talk about the other guys, but like any of them. I think that Notre Dame's done a tremendous job building out their 2026 quarterback board. Hart is one of the more recent ones. They offered him in December, and I think Troy Hunt they offered at the end of January, but otherwise they offered a lot of those guys last summer or, or early in the fall, so – of all, of all the positions for pot of gold day quarterbacks, the only one they didn't offer anyone because they already got those offers out It's smart. You know, they, you don't need to wait around because court, I mean, quarterback recruiting starts so early running back receiver. Some of those positions offer pot of gold day. That's fine. But I really liked getting those offers out early. Uh, another thing I'll mention on Brady Hart, his high school teammate, I believe he's number, I think, no, number five in this footage, I believe, is, is his name's Javon Boggs, committed to the Buckeyes. Um, and so if Brady Hart were to commit to Notre Dame, could, I mean, I think it could be like a cherry on top that the Irish would be in a better position to try to flip Javon Boggs. They did offer a few weeks ago. Um, and 
I don't know. Hearts visiting April 3rd, I believe it is. Could Boggs visit with them? That's that's an interesting kind of side note. I, I, I'm a big fan of this kid. What? Notre Dame is as well. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see where it goes, Tim. So what's the visit order? Do, did, I mean, all the, a bunch of all them right, visit, let's, right? Let's dive into that next. Um, okay, Singer. All right, so Notre Dame has seven quarterback offers out. Now, the one I don't think that they're really in the mix for anymore is uh, Will Griffin from Tampa Jesuit. I just never really got the sense that he was very interested in Notre Dame. I don't know but what exactly that looks like, but I don't think Notre Dame is very much in the mix there. So uh, you got Ryder Lyons, uh, Folsom, California. Um, his brother plays at USC. I don't think that one's too likely for Notre Dame. Irish love him. We'll see. Jared Curtis from Nashville. Notre Dame's trying. He's he dropped the top six. Yeah, Tim loves him. He's, uh, unbelievable. He's, he's unbelievable. He's this year's McNamara, the big giant yeah. kid who's the 25 guy going to Tennessee. That's who he, he's, he's this year's guy. Uh, oh, McIntyre. George McIntyre. Yeah, McIntyre. Yeah, yeah. McIntyre so, yeah. yeah, Notre Dame would like to be more in the mix there, but I, I think it's unlikely. Brady Schmeigel is one to keep an eye on from California. Visit in January. Told me that he's looking to get back in the summer, potentially. Obviously, Brady Hart would have spent a lot of time on. Uh, Noah Grubbs, talk about your order of visits, okay. Tim. He's visiting this weekend. Oh, wow. uh, so, I don't know. But he's also got a, a, a handful of more visits. So, I, I talked about quarterback recruiting in a video with Darren today. And that will post tomorrow afternoon. And So, you guys get to watch that as well. There's some more quarterback talk. But uh, I, I basically was like – not all of these guys that we're talking about have more visits lined up. So you wouldn't think that they're going to be committing anytime soon if they're taking these trips. But I just get this sense that someone's just going to be like, yeah, I want Notre Dame. Screw the other trips. I want Notre Dame. So it's just a matter of which one do does that. If, if, if they do. My guess, obviously, is Hart. But Grubbs, Gr I could very much see a world where Noah Grubbs uh, commits to Notre Dame, and then I, I talk about Will Will Griffin. Think that's more of a long shot, uh, and then Troy Hun Hun uh, is visiting Notre Dame next um, next I mean, Rankings are all over the place. Yeah, and I'll, I'll I'll I mean I'll mark this right now. Hun may end up being number one or two. I mean he is. I don't know why I am so intrigued after watching his film. Like this yeah. dude is a hell of a football player already. Yeah. That is Steve Sarkeesian's top guy that he's going after at Texas. So and he's very impressive. Yeah, on three, he's got him ranked as number five quarterback. Got rivals 15. I, I don't know what 24-7 has him at. If, yeah, yeah. 24-7 even them. hasn't ranked them. So I'm telling you guys, like, the it's all over the place. Like, one site is very high on this kid, and, you know, the other's not. It, it Which is how it should be. I mean, it, different strokes for different folks. I mean, the college coaches have different opinions on the kids. So that's, uh, that's very much just kind of just how it is. So it's um, a, yeah, you know, just a, you know, as you like to say, put a bow on it, so to speak. It is a super talented class. It, I mean, you just can't lie about it. It's like, it's, it's, it's a fun class. I mean, it's a fun class, Mike. And even the first guy who's visiting, you read it all up on him and it's, the guy looks like all oh, he sounds like he loves the Gators, but he's been to Notre Dame. I think I think he was at the Ohio State game last year. So him coming back, you know, like, yeah, yeah, oh, a shot. You're still in it, even though he's a Florida guy. He's visiting all the Florida schools. Notre Dame getting these guys to campus is huge. Yep, definitely. So uh, we're going to bring on uh, 2026 wide receiver commit Dylan Faison, younger brother Jordan Faison, in about ten minutes. Uh, and then we'll talk to him for a little bit. We'll, then we'll bring on Tyler Horker to talk some Notre Dame spring football. Uh, let's go ahead, though, and hear um, from our sponsors over at Augie's Locker Room. So you guys know about it. You've been hearing me talk about Augie's for quite some time. So you know that if you're in store, uh, excuse me, if you're in South Bend, you got to pop over to the store, which does have a new location, 1733 North Ironwood Drive in South Bend, it's just down the street from campus. Check out augieslockerroom.com um, for much more information. And you can check out the online store. So make sure that you're making time for Augies. Check out the wide selection of Notre Dame Stadium pieces. 
jerseys, helmets, autographs, and one-of-a-kind Rockney items, Joe Montana signed items, famous sculptor Jerry McKenna's replicas of the bronze statues around the stadium. Check out the vintage helmet display dating back to 1890. Augie's got some amazing stuff you're going to check out. And you can do that at augieslockerroom.com uh, to see the online store, uh, 574-277-6363. Give them a call, 574-277-6363, augieslockerroom.com. So Notre Dame did add a new commitment uh, this past Monday. So just a couple days ago, Tim, Dylan Faison, 5'11", 170 pounds is what he's listed at. Uh, yeah, obviously, younger brother Jordan Faison, who was in the 2023 class for Notre Dame, late commitment as a preferred walk-on, comes to Notre Dame, starts balling out. Uh, I remember fall camp, Cal Kelly raving about him. Uh, and then we see Jordan, you know, catching touchdowns. Uh, and then obviously, Sun Bowl MVP uh, and uh, a scholarship player, Notre Dame. And now on the lacrosse team, he's balling. Uh, so Notre Dame, very familiar with the Faison family, offered Dylan on Sunday. And then, yeah, Tim went ahead and got him committed. So I wanted to pop on his film with you. Tell, tell me what you think about this pickup for the Irish. Well, I, mean, I mean, he's super, super athletic. I mean, you watch this film, it's, you know, YouTube, you see him as a return guy, wide receiver, all those things. I looked him up, you know, his uh, his team and where he plays and stuff like that. Really good football down there in his region of Florida, down there in Boca. He, he's He's got wiggle. He's got a little jitter, and those are things I always look for. Like a guy – hey, I always talk about a guy who could catch a damn bubble and break a tackle and go get some yards. He's definitely got some of that in him. So he's, he's a fun one to watch, and then – and then you keep learning more about him. And it's like, this guy's the number one lacrosse player in the country. It's like, how, how athletic is this guy? How much talent do, you know, does he have? And he's going to come play football, lacrosse, same thing as his brother. So whatever that family is eating down there, Mike, whatever they, you know, the Cheerios, keep doing it, man. Because it is working, mom and dad. It is working. And it's, uh, it's impressive. He's a competitor. That's one thing you're going to see a lot about this dude is this guy's going to compete like crazy because he's a high, high achieving athlete, meaning football and obviously with his ranking of where he's at in the in the lacrosse world. So he's fun. I mean, it, it's exciting to get another phase on. Phase on's a heck of a had a heck of a freshman year. You see the same type of skills that you know his little brother has. And um see two of these guys run what he'll be Mike, it's so far away since he shows up. Is yeah, Jordan may be gone, right? So <laughs> it couldn't uh, we'll be yeah. yeah, exactly. You forgot, man. This guy still has two more years of high school to go. So, but uh, no, it's exciting. It's a hell, hell of a play. That one right there. And he just jumps it and goes. So he's a fun, fun athlete. And we always talk about athletes, get athletes on the field. And um, he, he, he's definitely one that's going to be coming to South Bend having some fun. Well, I guess let's go ahead and bring him on the show. He's backstage. So we've got Dylan Faze on. I, I like that. I like the Notre Dame shirt. Already, there it looks sharp. Geared up. He's geared up, ready to roll. Is that your? Is that from your brother? Did he send you that for Christmas? Or yes, sir. There you go. Start getting the hand me downs already. Yeah. So I was talking to Kyle Kelly on uh, Tuesday, and he was like, "Dude," or no, Monday night. He was like, "Dude, I just talked to Dylan Faison uh, for an interview." He's like, "You got to get him on your your show." So that's when I hit you up, Dylan, and I'm very thankful that you. Uh, we're able to hop on here. So can you walk me through this recruiting process for Notre Dame? Because obviously offer commit back-to-back -back days. But I'm guessing that they probably told you ahead of Sunday that you were getting the offer. So can you kind of walk me through what this process has looked like with Notre Dame? Of course. So about a month ago, their, their um, school had reached out to my school to get my transcripts and my school doesn't allow anybody to access your files without having pr approval. So once they reach out, they tell me and I kind of had knew that they were coming to, to look at us. And about a week after that, Coach Brown had got my Instagram and he DM me, got my number and we, we went back and forth for those, those two weeks. And then around the 16th, Chad Bowden uh, sent me a DM and was kind of Letting me know, hey, like a day before you kind of kind of got the offer and let me know the things I should post and, and all the beforehand stuff. And that day that I got the offer, I called Coach Brown 
and he let me know. And then I talked to all the staff, the offense coordinator, Denbrock, talked to Bowden again, and then talked to Freeman for a little bit. And the day after that, you know, I, or the night, I talked to my family and we had we had knew about it and we were we were basically committed committed then and I called coach let let him know at about like 12 and he was he was he was fired up and I talked to Freeman after and he let me know that this is my journey and that they're looking at me for me and not for anything that my brother's done and he's excited to see where I am so okay so you you got the news on s- this past Saturday is that right yes sir so you were like, bro, what do I need to wait for? Like, it, exactly. Was that your mindset? Like, oh, I don't care if X school, like, oh, that, that'd be great. Like, uh, I'm not going to name any school names, but, you know, use your imagination. I don't really care if that school offers. I know where I want to go. Was that kind of your mindset of just go ahead and committing? And it definitely, definitely that mindset. And we were running off of a high from the lacrosse game that I had right before that with, with Lake Highland Prep. We won pretty good. So, you know, coming off. Or coming onto the bus to go home three hours and grab my phone and see the DM from from Bowden, you know, we were fired up. So So what is it about Notre Dame that makes you want to commit right there? So you're not any prospect because you do have an intimate knowledge of Notre Dame because your brother going through the recruiting process, you got to witness that. You've been to some games, I'm sure, been to campus many times now. So what is it about Notre Dame that made you want to go ahead and commit? You know, definitely their community. Their community is one of the best that I say the best that has any program has to offer. So, so they're definitely supporting cast that's around you, number one. And their main thing that I love about the school is the life after sports. You know, we all have an end, and we all have to find ways to be successful after after our legs stop working and we get tired and we don't want to be hit anymore. So, you know, there's there's a point where that stops and that you have to use your brain to to push forward and be more successful without your athleticism. So, you know, that all comes to an end eventually for everybody, whether you like it or not. So their school offers the most out of that, that section that I would look for. So it's definitely exciting to know that's in the next six years. Yeah. Listening to Dylan Faison talk, I'm thinking about when I was a sophomore in high school uh, and I don't think I could complete a sentence. And here's Dylan Faison talk about life after football and all these things. So um, thanks. Thanks for making me feel bad about myself, Dylan. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, okay. You call the staff to commit. What's their reaction? Like, were, were they kind of surprised that you were calling this early? Were they or like, what was kind of their reaction? Just super fired up? You know, definitely fired up, excited. But I think Coach Freeman had new from – from definitely how I how I kind of talked to him before we went. My brother went on a lacrosse visit. This is what me and my family always talk about. He went on the visit, and they're they're bringing him in to the to his office. And, you know, he had to go through all the stages to get to his office. They're going upstairs. The flights are going through all these these fields, and it's crazy just to get to the office. You know, we're already super excited to be there. And the first, I was the first one walking in for some reason. Jordan was behind me, and he had made a, made a comment, and I didn't forget that comment. And it was, he says. Uh, you know, we, we would love to get two up here. And that stuck with me ever, ever since. And I think that he knew that the day after that, I was calling to commit. So he was, he was definitely expecting that. So what I've been told about your recruiting process is that you are coming, you tell me if I'm wrong, as a football player who will play lacrosse and not the opposite. Does that sound right? Yes, sir. So tell me about like your plans for that. Obviously. It's we got a couple years here, but what's kind of the the thought process going to Notre Dame, doing two sports? I'm sure it kind of helps that you can, you know, just speed dial your brother and he'll tell you exactly what it's like, and you get to see that. But just curious for your perspective on it. Yeah, you know that's definitely that's definitely a help, but I think it's better if you go on it through your own journey because some people have different journeys. So my brother's journey might not exactly be the same, but I do plan to follow the exact blueprint that he's going on right now to, you know, be successful in football season, try to try to improve in that section. And then when lacrosse season comes around, focus on lacrosse, be the best version of myself at that sport, because at the end of the day, they're in two different seasons, uh, fall versus spring. So, you know, I should have time to to plan accordingly for both of them. So Okay. One more thing from me before I throw it over to Tim. I don't really know anything about lacrosse. So can you can you kind of walk me through like what you do on the field, like your position, um, what makes you lacrosse magazine's number one player in the country? Like kind of break that down for me. So, you know, 
I can't really tell you what makes their their choice number one. You know, I'm always grateful for that, but I didn't know what went through their heads of how I play. But I definitely have a different play style. So I play for St. Andrews, of course, out of Florida, with a great group of kids around me. Like we have a couple other kids that are on that top 50 for the 26 class, including an army commit. So you know, it's having a great supporting cast around me that's also doing some good work. But for my position specifically, I'm a midi and attackman. So you know when they need me up in the box to go down and run the ball up and down, you know, I can be athletic and use my athleticism there. But when they also need me on the offense end, I can, I can play there and ride and get the ball back. So it's also a help there. So that's kind of my, my role. You also have defense, which a midi goes and plays down and plays defense. And that's also one of my strong suits. So, you know, trying to be the best on the offense and defense side of the ball, especially in the middle of the field is, is where I kind of excel. So that's definitely my position for the team. Cool. Tim. Yeah, real quick, Dylan. Who's the guy that's behind the goalie all the time, just hanging out? That's the that's the guy I want to know on lacrosse. Because every time I watch Notre Dame, you know, when they're on ESPN, there's always a guy hovering in the background. Who's that guy? So yeah, that's that's typically for Notre Dame. It's typically typically Pat Cavanaugh. You know, he's he's great. He's 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 great with decisions. But that's your ex attackman. So he's yeah. the guy that that when the ball goes out of bounds, he picks it up and he makes the play and he makes the initial thought process for how the how uh, the rest of that drive is going to go for the offense. So having Pat back there is pretty easy for the, for the other game. All right, good to go. I didn't know if that was the guy who's always cherry picking back there, waiting to get the little loose ball and get the quick goal. So, but that's Kavanaugh. He scores all the time, doesn't he? So you always hear his name. But uh, my question is, first thing I told Singer this morning was, buddy, you're like an elite athlete going to play two of the biggest champ. I mean, I mean, seriously, I mean, you're championship level athlete, lacrosse, Notre Dame football, two programs that are fighting for championships. So what is your training regiment? Do you have a – I mean, what is it as you move forward? Here you are already talking about signing at football in 18 months, basically. Singer and I are trying to figure out the next 18 minutes. So you already got – you already know what the heck you're doing months from now. So what do you do football? Obviously, then you got lacrosse. Is lacrosse kind of a winter season as you go into spring? I guess I want to ask you more about, you know, like I said, your trainer. Do you have a personal trainer? Because you are preparing to be a dude at the highest level of college athletics in the next, you know, 18 months. Yeah, so definitely in the spring I'm focused on from football and lacrosse because, you know, there's there's also a spring game for the high school. And so I try to stay as much involved in both as I can. So I'll never miss a practice in spring. And I'll miss a lot of practices for football that they have, but I'll try to be at the most for football to show my dedication to the team and that that I'm here to work with them. And the same thing comes for fall. So when it's football season, I'm focusing football and I won't miss practice for that. And we have fall sports, but our fall doesn't involve with our school. It involves our club, 91. So, you know, I'll, I'll fly and it's on the weekend, so I'll fly up and down for that. But when the summer comes around, I'm training with Donnie. Uh, we train two times a week sometimes three because depending on the lacrosse schedule that we also have in the summer. So that's definitely a help. And then do it again and again and again until he gets to the next level. So uh, just to bounce off of that, you know, during the summer, obviously lacrosse camps are huge nationally. I mean, I'm up here in New England and New England's lacrosse nation all up and down, you know, going down in the Atlantic is, um, are you traveling during the summer times on a, on a national, you know, under 18 team, so to speak? Um, yeah, I didn't really get into that. So I live in New York for the summers. Me and my brother both do. We live with two other kids, Nick Testa and Blake Farnsworth that are on my, my club team. But uh, I play for this team, uh, 91 Long Island. They're located on the island and it's a really good program. I think top, top five for the rankings for the programs around the country. So they're great. And I say they always made us, but that, that program is, is special and that's where we go. So it's great to be around that that type of program during the summer. Gotcha. gotcha. My you know, my last question is more of a little fun one. Of I was reading about your brother. He was only 48th ranked, by the way. Only 48th ranked. I saw in the national lacrosse rankings. Obviously, with your ranking, where you're up there and all that stuff. So, are you? Since you're the younger brother, younger brothers always get picked on. I'm the oldest of you know three, so I always picked on my on my little brothers. But are you motivating? Are you keeping tabs? Are you keeping a journal of everything your brother's doing? So when you get into South Bend, you're going to be like, yeah, they're going to know Dylan in a few years, not Jordan. Yes, sir. Uh, definitely. That, that's the goal. 
you know, the younger one's always the better one. So I'm trying to take everything that he has, that he has right now and that he uses right now, and I'm going to use that immediately. So whatever I hear that he's doing up in South Bend, I'm starting to do it right now just to be the better version of him, you know. I love it. I love it. Brotherly smack talking. Nothing's better than that. So you just keep keep that energy going, okay? Yes, sir. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, last thing for me, Dylan, and then we can get you out of here. I'm curious about like your family dynamic with you being an athlete, um, your, Jordan being a heck of an athlete. I'm guessing you have a lot of athletes in your family. Um, yes, uh, I think my whole family is a bunch of athletes on the mom side and dad side. Uh, but I think they're both kind of equal. I can't take one that side that's better. I think my mom was a great athlete in, in high school and college. So was my dad. So, you know, definitely a great group of genes to have. So, And someone was talking in the comments like they ran track or track, did track and field? Yeah. My mom was – she, she got, on, got on me for this for saying it last time, but she claimed she was a beast <laughs> at, at track and field. And my dad was a beast at wrestling. So, you know, they both they both are really, really good. And he played football in high school as well. So Okay. All right. Good deal. Well, that's uh, class of 2026 wide receiver Jordan Faison committed to Notre Dame just a couple days ago. Um and yeah, you're gonna be a, a fantastic representation, um, you know, of a fighting Irish student athletes. Uh, again, sophomore in high school, guys. This is a sophomore in high school, and he is that well spoken. Um, and uh, yeah, fantastic young man, great athlete. Really looking forward to uh, following your recruitment these next couple of years, Dylan. And we'll definitely be in touch, man. Thank you, Dylan. Right, good luck to you, man. Have a great, great lacrosse season. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Right, thank you, Dylan. Someone said in the YouTube comments, his background is a promo for his dad's business. That's sick. I, I just, I'm just seeing this. That is awesome. I, I mean, talk about like coming on the show and being like, Hey, I got a cool backdrop, rep my dad's business. I love it. I love it. Did you think we would learn so much about lacrosse? That was, I mean, seriously, I'm not a lacrosse guy. I watch yeah. it because Notre Dame's good. I don't, I don't know any positions whatsoever. So thank you, Dylan. That was awesome. The sense I got, and people are going to crucify me for this, is, is that like it, it's got a lot of similarities to soccer. Like his position did seem just like a box to box midfielder. Um, that that you know, because I'm, I'm I'm a big soccer guy. So, um, okay, I meant to say this. I I meant to say this at the beginning. I was I was going to say Dylan. I'm going to call you Jordan. Just forgive me. So if I called him Jordan, I fully expected myself to call him Jordan. Um, so Dylan, if you're still watching this, bro, um, the, I mean, yeah, that was just bound to happen. I call yeah. Tim Tom all the time. Hey, I've been working with him Dylan, for that's years. Why Dylan's got his journal. He's just checking little things. <laughs> I loved that answer, by the way. Tim, when oh, you told me you were going to ask him that, I was like, yeah, I'm not asking him that. No, I, you know, because you, you just, you just, you know, you didn't, you never know what the relationships can be like. But the fact that he didn't just give a politically correct answer and oh, that he went to, yes, I am. I loved it. I loved that answer. Um, and I've been telling, I've been saying my last time I went on the Goolsby show, and then last this past Wednesday when we did our show, that people are lofting up too much expectations on 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 Jordan. I'm 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 backtracking on that. I See, dude, in watching some of the clips, listen, in watching some of the clips, and it was just in shorts and t-shirts, um, you know, where where he's just kind of, you know, walking through the lines and you know catching some passes here and there that Tyler took. Um, I, dude, I'm like, all right, yeah, maybe, maybe let, let's pump all the stock on this. The thing, and then I went to, hold on, and then I watched a lot of his footage, practice footage from last year, and I kind of combed through it. I'd be like. Because again, I feel like people are lost and so much expectations on Jordan Faison for a sophomore year. And I'm like, guys, let's pump it a little pump the brakes a little bit. I don't know. I'm 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 kind of backtracking. I think the expectations for him to be like receiver two, you know, catch yeah. you know, six hundred yards, you know, six touchdowns. Like I think that the that's that's real. Um, so it's yeah. I I've I've used this term before. I call it high achievers, and it's like but Notre Dame gets these guys that are just high achievers at their high school, elite high school level. And then you get Jordan and now Dylan phase on these guys are like, they're just wired different. I mean, they're playing. I mean, how, how many goals does Jordan phase have this year for Notre Dame? Like a dozen. It's like, how the hell yeah. are you scoring a dozen goals? 
He's a true freshman on a defending national title team that if he wasn't on the team, they would still be ranked number one or two, whatever they are right now. And it's, it's that high achievers, man, guys that just have big goals or just refuse to lose. The more you get guys like that in your program, it's like a uh, great house. Great house is a perfect example of that, where he came from and the way he played and keep rising, you know, uh, Kingston also the same thing out of Bosco. Every time I see a clip of that guy, I'm like, my God, is he a good looking freshman? And it's like, you just keep, keep bringing those types of guys in. So um, I'm stoked for both Bayzons, man. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. What a heck of a family. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. So, yeah, three years apart. Um, so when Dylan yeah, gets here, senior, be, what, senior, senior? Freshman. senior freshman. Yeah. Figured it out. Okay. So there you go. So tell us. Yeah, does he get a COVID or red shirt? Who knows, right, Mike? We, 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 <laughs> COVID <laughs> year. <laughs> he gets a little cross bonus year. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Right? Who knows where the yeah. heck we're going to be? Dude, who, 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 you, uh, the, the Pandora's box that got opened um, with Caden Proctor leaving a school and going back in the same offseason, and apparently he doesn't have to sit out. It, dude, college football – Excuse my French. It's a, it's a shit show. Like it, it, like just they're just making this crap up as they go. But uh, tough act to follow for uh, blue and gold uh, beat reporter Tyler Horka um, following uh, uh, Dylan Faison. I know I'm, when I've been writing about Dylan, I've wrote Jordan Faison so many times. I I've, I've got to I've got to get my crap together here. But uh, we're bringing on Tyler Horka. So Tyler Notre Dame practice today after a 13 day hiatus. You guys got to see the first, what, half hour practice, um, you know, the stretching and then five periods, I believe it is. So, Tyler, what did you think about practice today? What were some of your general notes and impressions? Yeah, I was really keyed in on those wide receivers, and we were joking kind of the media that was there. The new setup, well, first of all, I've got to say, I don't know where you guys are at. I guess you're in Atlanta, Mike, and then, Tim, you said you're up in the Northeast right now. Is that right? I'm gonna. I'm willing to guess it's colder here than either location where you guys are. Maybe not the Northeast, but windy is all heck in South Bend. Still, I joked on the YouTube video that I did earlier today. I don't know why we're calling this spring practice. We might as well call it winter practice. So just to set the scene for you guys, we're in the IAC, and some of the units actually did go outside for a little bit once they broke from stretches and individual drills. So I think you had the offensive line, defensive line out there. But like skill position players, quarterbacks, heck no. Why would you go throw a ball in 30 mile an hour wind gusts? I think the wind chill was 15 degrees when I woke up and took the dog outside today. So mostly everything is happening in the IAC. And on the sideline that they let us stand, the wide receivers are right in front of our face. So I'm like, you know what? There's some new faces in this group. I might as well get accustomed to seeing these guys. So I was looking at Chris Mitchell. I think Jaden Harrison is like like he's the athlete that he was billed to us to be when, when we're writing all of our stories, like, Hey, this guy is committing and signing with Notre Dame out of the transfer portal. You read into him a little bit. You're kind of surprised that he had meager wide receiver statistics because I look at him running routes. I'm like, Holy cow, get this guy on the field right now, throw him the football. It's not just a route running too. It's, Okay, that's really good. But then when he has the ball in his hand, he looks like he knows what to do with it. And I think Notre Dame has been missing some guys like that lately. So I'm impressed still by Mitchell. I'm impressed still by Harrison. Uh, I think the freshman wide receivers, Micah Gilbert and Cam Williams, both look really good. Like I had to double take the roster today. And I mean, we got this roster, like you said, Mike, 13 days ago when they handed it to us for that first spring practice. M Micah Gilbert is every bit of 204 pounds. And Cam Williams, it looks like he's bigger than 202 pounds. So I'm impressed by the, the freshman wide receiver size. And then as for the other stuff, um, I, I noted this in another video as well. I think that it was notable that when the cornerbacks did a little drill where they pair up and kind of go down the field together and they're really just working on coverage and, and backpedaling and sticking to what would be a wide receiver if it wasn't their teammate cornerback uh, lined up across with them. It was Benjamin Morrison and Kristen Gray who were the first two guys, and there's the video there. Uh, I, I thought that was notable because I've seen enough of these drills to know that the first guys going are usually your top dogs, and I think those are Notre Dame's two top dogs at the cornerback position. You know one of them in Benjamin Morrison, and I think from what we saw last year, 
Uh, Christian Gray is probably going to be that other guy that that starts in place of Cam Hart. So th- those were the biggest things that I noticed. If you want to pick my brain and, and jog my memory uh, oh, yeah. of some other stuff, I mean, yeah. th- 30 uh, minutes okay. was – it doesn't seem like a long time, but, you know, we get to see quite a bit. Yeah. All right, Tim, I'm going to just talk with Tyler a little bit, and we'll throw it to you. Um, I had a few other clips pulled up. Um, I, I wanted to mention Jaden Harrison – Completely with you. I, I mean, obviously, I watch all the clips that you guys shoot. Uh, I'm not there, but see it the, from the video. He looks so good. I was not expecting him. To, I just thought he would be like a use him, you know, throw him a bubble here and there, use him as a returner or whatever. He looks like a like a legit receiver to me. Um, running his routes, how he catches the football, looks confident. I, I'm surprised he didn't and- have bigger numbers at Marshall. Yeah, I'll just say one more thing quickly on him. He just just from these two practices that we've seen in terms of fluidity and the way that he moves as a wide receiver, he's what everyone wanted Chris Tyree to be. And I'm not saying Chris Tyree had a bad year last year. Like Notre Dame needed him and he made plays, but just like the way that he runs around out there, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's the the little slot guy yeah. that goes out there and somehow just gets open and it's like Jordan Faison, but a little bigger, honestly. He's got a little yeah. more bulk and, and heft to his frame. Yeah, yeah. Jay Carr says there wasn't enough of Hartman in, t- oh, c- in today's practice clips. Come on. Get- hey, Did Pro Day's tomorrow. We'll, standing back there? We'll have plenty of Hartman tomorrow, Pro Day. So, yeah, he did look handsome. I, look at my – look, do you think I'll ever be able to grow a beard like that? At least you're halfway there, Mike. I'll never be able to grow a beard like like. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that they want to buy your shirt in the YouTube comments, Tyler, so – it's a Tiger Woods. Um, it's a relic at this point. Tiger Woods has that new clothing line. So, like, I'm. I don't know why I'm wearing this. I might be able to sell it for some money in like ten years. <laughs> uh, you wrote about Angeli uh, and, and this particular mm-hmm. pre- play in your uh, in your practice report. Uh, I mean, yeah. It, it, who, who's that playing say, linebacker there? Is that is that Micah Gilbert? I mean, uh, obviously there wasn't. Yeah. This is more of a walkthrough, but. Uh, curious, you know, just your thoughts on the on the quarterbacks through a couple practices. Yeah, this was um, just this period in particular. I thought was pretty interesting. It was a little glimpse into Mike Denbrock's mind, I think, and the offense that he's trying to bring to Notre Dame. They spent five minutes in a row just zone reading the heck out of this walkthrough, like you said, Mike. And like I get it, there, there's offensive players playing defense, but but Denbrock, you can see him right there was literally up in the grill of these quarterbacks saying, I I don't care if there's no defense on the other side. I want you to make the right read. If you see the offensive lineman perfecting their duo, then you're going to hand the ball off to the running back and and he's going to run up, run behind it. But if you don't like what you see there, you're going to pull it and you're going to run the other way. And there was even a pass thrown out of this. Um, this might be it right is. here. Yeah. Where, where Riley Leonard throws the ball to Deion Colsey there. So I just liked the ingenuity and just like, like I said, it was a peering into Mike Denbrock's mind where here, I, I think you're going to see a lot of RPO and like true RPO because you have Riley Leonard at quarterback. And as I mentioned earlier today, like Steve Angeli, I think he saw Riley Leonard come in and he's like, okay, this guy's not Sam Hartman. He can move around a little bit. And if I want to have a place in a college football offense in 2024 or beyond, I got to move around a little bit. So the RPO stuff that we saw in that one period, I I thought was pretty telling of what Mike Denbrock wants to do with this offense. Yeah. I I just wanted to pop this video up, Tyler, just to tell you, this is probably the best. This is some of the best content you've ever shot. You got Marcus Freeman B roll with CJ Carr throwing in the back. Great, great work, Tyler. It's, it's almost like, you know what the people want. They want the freshman quarterback and they want the handsome head coach. Very, very good work. And Debbie in the in the YouTube comments says Carr looks jacked. You like you, you like what you've seen from yeah. Carr so far? Yeah, he's bigger than uh, obviously he was as a a senior up there uh, in Michigan, and that that's what um, Tim knows this better than anybody being around the game as a coach. That's what January through late February, early, early March. And, and even, I mean, some of these guys, including CJ Carr, you can go do your football practice, but I guarantee you CJ Carr is still on the, I need to get a little bit bigger uh, mantra and just like Emil Wagner or anybody else at any position. So he's been working and Mike, 
you know this better than anybody. Tim, Tim knows the ins and outs of what these guys are doing, but you know the ins and outs of these young players, like mind frames and, and the way that CJ Carr sure. is. That that dude is competitive, and like yeah. if he's told if he's told he needs to get bigger, and you're going to be better because of it, it, he's getting bigger, and he's going to be better because of it. Okay, one more quick thing before we throw it to Tim. Were you able to glean anything new on the offensive line today? You know, like I, I for some of those, you know, eleven on eleven clips, it looked like there was like a second team O line in there with Wagner at right tackle. Um, were you able to take anything away? Yeah, from that walkthrough period, I didn't take anything away because as soon as I saw Riley Leonard taking snaps from, I believe it was Joe Odding, I was like, okay, this is not the first team yeah. offensive line. It, it was more so. And it was pretty cool. It might be Joe Rudolph and Mike Denbrock saying, we're going to hodgepodge this thing, mix and match. And because at the end of the day, it's about assignments. And chemistry is a thing along offensive lines. They gel like they start playing better throughout. We've seen that at Notre Dame all the time where an offensive line starts playing better later in the season because they're more comfortable around each other. But this is early and they're just like, all right, get the, get the assignments down. Um but the, the best thing that happened for us today was we actually talked to Joe Rudolph and we talked to some of these offensive linemen. And I get the sense that Ashton Craig is 100 percent your starting center. Uh, they yeah. really like what they love, what they have in Ashton Craig. Uh, Pat Coogan and Rocco Spindler are both back. They If Coogan didn't get or if Spindler didn't get hurt, he would have started all 13 games. Coogan started all 13 games. Those are your guards. And then Charles Jagasaw, you can pretty much. I don't want to do this because we thought Billy Shrouth and Andrew Christoffick would be starters at this time last right. year, and they weren't. But I think Charles Jagasaw is going to be your left tackle. Marcus Freeman loves him. Joe Rudolph loves him. Like he's the guy. Tosh Baker is old enough to be the guy, but like he has to prove it. He has to show it. It's a little bit like the Andrew Christoffick thing last year. Like, yeah. okay, you're next, but are you really next? You you got to prove that. So that just, I think this team has four pretty solid offensive start, offensive line starters, and. You just got to make sure Tosh Baker is your guy at right tackle. Yeah, I just don't not, know who he can't do it. Who can unsee yeah, who else? Baker? Yeah, Emil Wagner. Right. This was the most. This was the most interesting quote, and I wish I had it word for word in front of me. I'll paraphrase it. Joe Rudolph told us today. Be, be, I think he's sick of this Emil Wagner needs to gain weight thing, and that's all we talk about with Emil Wagner, right? He said Emil Wagner is very close to being the weight that we need him to be to be a very good tackle. Like they're not going to try to get him to beat beefed up to 310 pounds because Joe Rudolph said flatly today, Emil Wagner is not going to be a 310 pound tackle. That's just not in his, his DNA, literally his DNA and his makeup. He can't be that, but if he can be 290, 295 and play like a 315 pounder, then he's going to play and he's going to start for Notre Dame. So I, that's probably the competition. It's, it's Baker and Wagner. Okay, definitely. Last thing you were kind of talking Spindler. Were, were you, you <laughs> your uh, frame froze on a funny face? Are are, are you thinking <laughs> Spindler over Shrouth? Is that the vibe you're getting? Yeah, just because he played all those games, man. And that's you can't substitute experience, especially at that position. Like that's why you see so many senior offensive lineman, not just at Notre Dame, it's all over the place. I think what's helping Spindler, Mike, is uh, Joe Rudolph told us today that he's 90% back from that knee injury. And th there was a time there, like December, January, they didn't know Spindler was going to be 20% in the spring at all. So he's healthy. He's taking these reps. And it just makes it that much harder for Shrouth, to, who doesn't have all those starts. He only has three compared to Spindler's 10, I believe it is. It's tougher for him, but like, hey, he. I wrote the story on Billy Shrouth. You guys should all go read it if you're watching this right now. Blueandgold.com, premium story. Like Billy Shrouth is definitely, if he's not starting, Mike, he he is more firmly the number three guard than he was in August when, flat out, he just wasn't ready. Now he's ready, and now he started a few games. Like he he can play at this level. He proved that against Wake Forest, Stanford, Oregon State. I believe those were his three starts. Um, yeah, he's ready. And, and so, like, if he started against Texas A&M, I wouldn't be shocked. But I think it's kind of hard to unseat Spindler with all those starts. Yeah, who knows? Maybe it could be like a Spindler shroud that Coogan gets unseated. Yeah, it obviously remains mm -hmm. to be seen. We'll, we'll go over to you, Tim. Yeah, yeah, no, I just had um, one thing, just bouncing off of Rudolph. I actually watched, you know, his his, inter his interview today. And, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, he sounded positive about a bunch of guys, no doubt about it. He's yeah, He did keep using the word young a lot. And it's like, he is right. There's a lot of dudes, some young guys, even though you got some old guys, Baker, obviously, Coo I mean, Coogan's a senior now. Rocco's a senior. But, you know, even Schroff is an upperclassman as a junior. You wouldn't think about that. But the rest of these guys, there are some young guys. And, you know, you're saying Jagasaw is the left tackle. The backups have zero. I mean, I, the backups are like wide open behind behind Charles. So that's a little interesting. I did hear Wagner did say at his press conference, he weighs 290. He's like, I weigh 290. I don't know why everyone keeps saying 280. I'm 290. And uh, God, man, if he could, like, like you said it perfect, Tyler, if he could stay at 290, hit 295, just keep eating some mashed potatoes, keep that weight on. His athleticism is, it's freakish. It just is. When Joe Alt was on with us last week, Joe Alt talked about They'd be practicing. You just see this this blur running by all the time, and it's Wagner. Alt was like the guy is unbelievable athletically. So he had some really. He played a bunch last year too. You know, a lot of the you know mop up time and things of like that. So we did get a lot of reps. You get out there. So you're right. That right tackle is going to be a it's going to be a war to see who comes out of that thing. But um, I have a big question. You know, when you know, you know, so many other positions have been talked about. What's your take on running back? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with a hot take singer here, and I'm gonna say, what do you think about Price being basically one and done? The way running backs are these days, does Price go out there, kick butt, go to the NFL? I mean, he is a junior after all. So, what do you think about Price out there? Yeah, that's a good thought, and I don't think I've thought about that at all because he's another, he's like one of those guys where you think as a you think of him as a freshman last year because he didn't yep. get to play in that first year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, Tim, it depends on how they split up that workload. Like there, there's a very real possibility that he doesn't touch the ball enough to have NFL scouts saying, hey, yeah, we want you now. Like let's get you while you're fresh and let's get you in here. So it, it comes down to that. Um, I, I This is looking more and more like – I was sitting there, standing there at practice today, and for the first time it hit me looking at the backfield. Oh, there is no – there's no Audric Estime back there. Like, they got to kind of refigure this thing out. And I get it. Jeremiah Love is really freaking good, and Jadarian Price is really good, and Jabron Payne's probably as good as a third back, like in those short yardage and yeah. what they ask him to do as there is. But to me, just the way that I, I see it, Tim, I think there's going to be a 1A, 1B thing again. And I don't know if I'm in love with that because if Jad if Jadarian Price is the number one running back and he gets 200 whatever carries like Audrey Estime got last year, he probably runs for just as many yards. I don't know if he scores as many touchdowns, but he might run for more yards than Audrey Estime did last year. Just a little and flash, the glimpses, the glimpses of seeing him in the practice film is like, oh my God, man. Yeah. He, the dude looks, he looks like a different guy. I mean, obviously, like you're oh, saying, like, and I keep going back to what McCullough said back in, you know, when he was there, like he was probably, I mean, who who's to say he doesn't start as a freshman? He was so high on him and he was having such a hell of a camp, boom, and he gets injured. So, and obviously Diggs and Estime took off that year. So, but I keep going back to that, those comments of how he was so dynamic, so electric as a freshman. And basically they were pretty smart, I, I feel, last year, because they, they knew they had Estime. They knew. He was going to be their one and done, their NFL guy as a junior. And now you're like, give him a few touches here and there. Give him some love. The big touchdown against USC, 100 yards in the bowl game. So, man, I could just see him just going out and just tearing it up this year. I mean, seriously, just tearing it up and be like, yeah, I'm going to the NFL. Why come back for a senior year? But, I mean, that's a long way off. But it's going to be one of my little uh, predictions. I want Singer to peg here in the middle of March to see what happens down the road. I like that you're getting out ahead of it too, because like I said, that's not even something I've thought about Jadar and Price going to the NFL, but he could, I just, I just really worry about the touches that he's going to get because we, we see him line up like one, a one B with, with love so far. It's only been two practices, but like we spend all this time talking about Jadar and Price. Like how could you not talk about Jeremiah? I love that way too. I, I think he's special as well. So it's a good place to be in with, with all these running backs. And it's the, it's the reason Devin Ford moved to safety. Cause like there's literally no room in that room. 
For, Not for to Lord. mention Kedron Young and Aeneas Williams, who Notre Dame is very excited about. It's last year's running back room was incredibly deep. This year is those guys not much yeah, different. Guys, they lost two guys, Estime and Ford. They, it might be they, just as deep. Yeah, those guys are probably going to get kickoff return touches and go play on the on the blocking unit and run from there because the other guys are stacked. Before I want to dive into quarterback, Tyler. How in the world is this team going to split up now that Singer's back on the bandwagon? The the reps with Faison and Greathouse. I mean, seriously, these two guys are electric. They're dynamic. They're both really good. They're they're slot receivers. How in the heck are they going to just split those guys up? Because Greathouse looks like a different dude. Greathouse looks like a, a senior already out there, the way he's running. He looks competitive. Going back to that word I used earlier with Singer with the Faisons is high achiever, where he came from once again. Had a hell of a freshman year. So how are they going to split those reps up is going to just be fascinating because, you know, as, as we expect them to be a true 11 personnel football team this year. I think the best thing that can happen for those two guys is for the Notre Dame offense to just be like a consistent, well-oiled machine where it's like it's almost like you're platooning them. You say like, all right, this is going to be great house series and we're going to go – 80 yards and eight plays and he's going to get a couple of those catches maybe even score the touchdown and then you're you feel comfortable enough to take him off the field and be like all right now we're going to go do the same thing with Jordan Faison and and he's going to get the same splits I just feel like last year with Chris Tyree and and Jaden Greathouse you felt like you had two really good guys there and they took the reps away from each other but some of those reps were five play series and Neither of them ever get a look, and maybe they were open, um, and, it, and the ball didn't go their way. So I, it, the best thing for those guys, and, and they can have a hand in that, is just the, the offense being good. And, and you're churning out yards and you're churning out plays because that's more opportunities. Like the name of the game in college football in 2024 is you want to run more plays. It doesn't mean you have to be up-tempo all the time. You just want your offense to be out there, and, and you want to grind out five, six, seven-yard drives and maybe even that's double digits sometimes because tim if, if notre dame is on the field for 12 offensive plays i guarantee you jordan Faison or Jaden greathouse is going to get a look on three or four of those in, in that given series just just based on what they can do out of the slot so um it, it's it's kind of the same situation as the running back room where you want Jadarian price to get his you want jeremiah love to get his but how can they get it at the same time it's the one football thing there's only one football uh, good, good problem to have, but only if your offense is good. Because at that point, you got two guys and they're never getting the ball. So th- it comes down to Mike Denbrock and Riley Leonard figuring it out and, and and knowing how to get them the football. Because if they figure that out, those two guys will get the football and they can share that space in the slot. Yeah, that's a good point. Real quick on the on the drives is if yeah, if you're marching, you're going 10, 12 plays. That means you're hitting a a slot on a third and five, a slot here and yeah. there. You know. On a, second and six and things of that nature you're right spreading that things around so what else you got singer do you um i mean i let's just dive into it then darn it i mean just talk quarterback tyler i mean let, let's do it let's jump right into it i've been dying I mean, i've told singer a thousand and two times like i loved reading your 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 stuff about riley leonard the duke things i couldn't believe how much agreement i have with you because i've watched a ton of his film as well and I got more head scratching than I do high fives. And I feel like at the end of the day, watching him. So, just give me your take. Um, it's, it's funny. I actually I, I reread your total things on here, and the the hork of positives for everyone on Leonard athlete. We can talk about that. Hell of an athlete. We know he could run around. You watch his highlight film. Goes crazy. Arm strength zips it. And the intermediate range, I feel, is really strong in that you know fifteen under. The, you know, the crossing type routes, the, the square ends that Notre Dame's had success with. And then you wrote a leader. Um, yeah, you see it. Because you know you're a leader when it's third and four. I'm going to break three tackles and run quarterback ISO and go get a first down and get hyped up. So, yeah, definitely. The weaknesses, Tyler, I am giving you high fives because I feel this the same thing, too. Uses his legs too much. You mentioned as one of your bullet points. Yeah. I feel like he breaks down too quick, doesn't settle on a throw, and just takes off. Is that Duke 
Was that the receivers? Was that the scheme? Who knows? He has a really good offensive coordinator. But that goes back to the development that you've talked about a lot. Progressions. That's using his legs too much. He doesn't progress, man. He he literally will just find one guy, and if it's not there, I'm running. I mean, you could see it on film as you've talked about. And all anyone has to do is just go and watch the the, uh, the Notre Dame game again on YouTube, and, and you see it. I know Notre Dame had a great D. Don't get me wrong, all that good stuff. But Riley Leonard's going to see a handful of that as the Notre Dame quarterback. They're not going against scrub U's all, all year, um, especially in game one. And then the biggie, man, which I – it's funny you wrote this because I said this to myself so much watching this film is too many fastballs. I love that you use that term because I feel he just chucked that thing a thousand miles an hour in like a spaz rhythm, just trying to get rid of the ball at times. So just tell, I mean, long winded there. I was just throwing out all your main bullet points in your uh, great articles. That was a rundown of what Tyler broke down after watching his what 22, 23 starts or whatnot. So, Let's jump in it for a few minutes. You, I mean, you've mentioned Denbrock Riley as a combo. Riley Leonard definitely going to be the guy in College Station. I think so. Like I, it's a black guy on Notre Dame almost. If you bring a guy like that in, and he's not the guy, and I get it. Like Alabama brought Tyler Buckner in, and, and he wasn't the guy, and that's a failed experiment. But you can only have so many of those failed experiments. And I don't think this is going to be like if this experiment fails, Tim, it's it's going to fail because he doesn't play well at Texas A&M. And then there's yeah. a game later in the year where you're like, OK, yeah, we need to have a short leash on this guy. He's going to be the guy in College Station. But some of those things do scare me. Like those aren't things that get solved in the next six months if he's been doing them for three years, Tim. He's been yeah. doing those things for three years. And we watched 21 starts. And the, the fastball thing, I think, you know, I, I think all of those three things that I wrote about in the negative column, uh, they all equally frustrate me because they're all so related. Um, the progressions and, and taking off early are definitely related in the sense that, like you said, Tim, he'll go back and he'll look and, okay, first read's not there. It's almost like he has this mechanism in his brain where he's like, I know I'm a really good athlete, so I'm going to gain yards no matter what. Like, I, I didn't have that guy, but I have myself. And I'm not saying he's selfish in any way. He's just that good of an athlete, and he'll take off. And But, but there were some situations, and they'll show replays. And, man, I watched so many hours of this film, and, I, and, and it just kept popping up to where I was like, okay, Leonard just gained 12 yards, and that's a first down, and the drive's still moving. But he could have had 30 if he would have thrown it to that guy. And you take 30 over 12 every single time. Um, and then with the fastballs, I use the uh, the phrase, like a mechanism in his brain, Tim, where he thinks that I'm just superior and I'm going to take off and run. I think there was also a mechanism in his brain where he sees a guy running a slant or a, a shallow crosser over the middle of the field, and he knows he's wide open. And he's like, it doesn't matter how I can throw this ball, how I throw this ball. If I just get it out there, this ball is going to be caught and it's fine because that guy's wide open. But then the, the the ball drops incomplete and you're sitting there thinking, okay, no, you, you couldn't just throw that any which way. If you would have thrown it just out in front of the guy and lead him a little bit and run him into the catch, th the guy's going for 20 yards. So it's maturity stuff. And, and like I said, I don't think that gets solved in – six months, but maybe with a guy as mature as Mike Denbrock, it does get solved because the stuff that you went through on the positive side, I think that that all screams potential. It's like he's a really good athlete. He has that good arm strength. We know that. He overplays it a little bit, but if he hones it and dials it in, it's like, okay, now you're talking about a guy that can make all of the five to 20-yard passes, and he does make the occasional 20, 30, 40-yard bomb too. Like I've seen him have touch on the ball downfield it's not his strongest suit i would say but like it's there for him so um if you just hone all of those things that's where denbrock comes in if he just figures out how to channel all that stuff i think you're talking about probably one of the i don't know 10 15 somewhere in there best college football quarterbacks in 2024 like that's that's best case scenario for notre dame and if he's a top 10 quarterback in college football with this defense and this running game that you're, you're talking about 10 and two Notre Dame, 11 and one Notre Dame college football playoff. He doesn't need to be the best. 
but he can be among those w- with the potential. And if he just, you know, fixes some of those shortcomings that we mentioned. Yeah, I mean, if he's if he's top ten, hell, they better be. Yeah, they better be eleven zero at worst. For, for, <laughs> if he's uh, if he has that type of season, yeah, he, he's interesting because you know Singer and I have talked about. It. I know Mike Goolsby's chat about it a billion two times. The the hype, obviously, with Hartman. I think that just stemmed from just wanting a quarterback to come here and sling the damn thing all over the place and have fun and in the wide receiver room. We, we we know about that. With Leonard, it has been dulled some, but is that dulled because he's just we're still, we're still trying to figure him out? I think he doesn't come with the yeah. with with the resume. I mean, Sam Hartman, for for whatever anyone thinks, he had a huge resume. He he came with a resume with a hell of a stat sheet attached to him and a, what 45 starts before he went to Dublin, Ireland. It's a lot of football. So he did have that with Leonard. It's still, it's, it's interesting. I, I really don't know what to expect and he's, going. And he's going. also Tim coming off like 2022. That's the Leonard that Notre Dame wants because he was throwing touchdowns. He was running in touchdowns. Like he was that dual threat. But he's coming off a injury riddled season. And you mentioned the Notre Dame game, Tim. And I think everyone on our board agrees he was not good as a quarterback. Like they figured out, hey, we can stay in this game and maybe even win it if we just run Riley Leonard all the time. And it almost worked. Duke almost won that game. Uh, what would the score have been? 14 to 13 or whatever yeah. it was when Duke was, was winning at that time. Like they almost won that game that way. But you don't want to do that. Like that, you don't want to have to do that. Duke had to do that because Riley Leonard wasn't throwing the football very well. Notre Dame is very good passing defense, like from the front seven to the the back end. We know that. But he wasn't going to win that game with his arm. And that was a bit of a concern to me because there were some other games in those 21 that we watched where it was it was evident early on, okay, Riley Leonard's not going to win this thing with his arm. And that's kind of a scary place to be in with the quarterback. Well, let me pause that before Singer dying to chat if he is. But um, but that's you know you know you mentioned Leonard going against uh, Notre Dame, but that's going to be Leonard going against I feel A and M. I A and M's got dudes on D. They're they got freaks all over the place. Hell of a obviously you know his head coach is there. So is it man it, going into that game? I feel is just wild because he's playing Mike Elko, his old coach. A and M, the atmosphere. This Leonard. Leonard has a little spazzy attitude to him at times when you watch. He looks nervous, like a nervous yeah. Nelly out there sometimes. Like, oh my God, I got to get rid of this damn thing, or I got to take off. You know, can he? Can he learn? Hell, he's a senior. Can he learn to control that as he goes into? I mean, you've been to College Station. What is it? One hundred ten thousand freaks are going to be there, yeah. loud as hell. So <laughs> it'll be wild. I like that. I like that. Freaks. <laughs> I said it, not you, since you're a you know Longhorn. I don't nope. want you getting upset with those Aggies. Go for it, Mike. I, I got, I got mm-hmm. nothing. We got we got nothing else uh, on the docket, Tim. I don't know if you had anything else for Tyler. I want to say I want to say something uh, like the little spazzy attitude or like just the the mannerisms. I did yes. notice that because, like I said, I watched enough of it to see like he. He freaks out a little bit sometimes, but the best thing I can say about Riley Leonard in that regard is his freakouts usually don't result in the worst. Like you can see a quarterback freak out and throw the arm punt interception on second down when you had two more, you know, a down at least more to live or take the sack. When Leonard freaks out, it's okay, I'm getting out of this sack and I'm going to somehow Houdini throw this pass away. It's incomplete. And now we're staring at the same yardage to gain that we had on the down before, but like that's a positive play sometimes when it could have been a sack or an interception or a fumble. Um, when, when he spazzes out, I'm, it's almost like if you're a fan, you're like, oh, no, I'm fearing the worst, but somehow he avoids the worst. So, And that, that goes back to the athleticism. Like He can get out of some pretty crazy situations. Last question. Last question, Mike Singer here, is Steve uh, – Steve, geez, Louise, Tim. Riley Leonard, Riley Leonard. Ah, oh, he gets a little twisty ankle. Has to go get some Gatorade. Who's first quarterback in College Station? Steve Angeli, and I know you don't want to hear that, and maybe some others. Go for, but... go for it. Go for it. So there you go. It's it's Steve Angeli. Like Steve did enough for me last year in garbage time. I get it, but 
And then Oregon State, who the heck were they playing defensively? I I, I get that as well. But sure. like he's he's done enough good things to know like, OK, crisis, because that, that'd be crisis mode, Tim. If you put all your chips in the Riley Leonard basket and you're like, this is a fourth yeah. year you know, a senior quarterback and we're going to start him in front of 110,000 against this old head coach. Like this is it. And then he's got to come out. That's crisis mode. And I want a guy who's at least played a little bit of football at the college level to go in there. And the only guy is, is Steve Angeli outside of a couple Kenny Minchie kneel downs or, you know, whatever he, he did in his freshman year. So it, it'd be Steve Angeli to me. So you say, so you say that, at, you know, you put your reporter hat here in South Bend. Is is it going to be a, a, a true competition? Do you get you know? Do you feel with all your buddies in South Bend, it is going to be Minchie? Maybe not so much Carr, I, I would say, but is Minchie truly going to be a battle for number two? Do you feel after? I know it's only two practices; they're in underwear for crying mm-hmm. out loud. But what you know? What's your take moving on here? Uh, n- not initially. I think Steve is pretty solid at, at number two. I think we could get into to fall camp though, and and maybe start having that conversation. And um, look, th- there's situations where the third guy in line in a, over the course of a season somehow becomes the guy, and I, that would be like that happens. And, and Notre Dame is dealing with a, a quarterback who is injury prone because he does so much. So. All of a sudden, Steve Angeli becomes the guy, and then C.J. Carr would be the number two. Like, I'm not saying that's going to happen in Notre Dame, and nobody wants that to happen for Notre Dame, but I feel pretty good that, like, in in that biggest disaster environment, if if Kenny Minchie or C.J. Carr, whoever's going to be that number three, is somehow number two and then somehow number one, like, I, I've said it, and I'll, I'll say it again, Tim, and you guys have probably said it on this show, this is the, the best – collection of four scholarship quarterbacks and you would hate for Notre Dame to lose any of them because this is the best collection of four that they've maybe ever, ever had, like at least in the last 20 years. And I'm younger than you guys. So I don't know exactly who was Brady Quinn's third in line, but like, I get it. He rate, he raises the level of that group, but like from Riley Leonard to CJ Carr senior to true freshman, and literally one quarterback in between. You have a junior and you have a true sophomore as well. I think these are the four best that Notre Dame has had in a long time and maybe ever. Jump in, Singer. Jump in. I'm just – I don't know. I, I feel like Tyler's playing to his crowd a little bit because he's, you know, he's talking to Tim about Angeli, and I feel like that – like not really. What what did I say bad about Angeli? No, I I feel like I it, it was very much like he's two by default, and I I think it's more. I think he's more than that. I you know. I don't think Tyler said that. I don't think Tyler said two by default. Yeah, he basically, he's he's two two by by default. default. Cool. Like he did cool. enough in garbage time. Like what well, was hey, Mike? You know, you know, you know. I like Steve, but that was all garbage time. I wrote last year like. He passed every single test, and he he was never given the hard test, though. He he passed geometry. He never even had to take calculus. I don't I don't think I don't think Oregon State was calculus. Maybe that was. Yeah. But for step for him geometry, like, for him to lock right? down the number two role, it's more than just what you did at garbage time. It's like how well that you are grasping this. The you know yeah. a, another playbook with Den Brock. How good you've looked in practice, you know where Minchie's at. I, I just, I, I think it's, I think it's more and than think, just, you know, games and Sun Bowl. I think that's where people might be underestimating Angeli is because we haven't seen him in those environments. I would love to, and like even today in that one period where they're running zone reads, I was like, okay, yeah, like Steve is getting this, and it, it, he, he's the only quarterback I saw pull it at any point and take off and run. And Mike Denbrock made sure to say, Hey, Steve, that was, that's what you do there. I like that. Like I heard Mike Denbrock tell Steve Angeli that. So if you're talking about grasping offense and like understanding what he needs to do, I, yeah, I, I, he's a smart kid. Just, just like the rest of them. Like, like he, I don't think any of the cerebral stuff is going to be a, a problem for Steve Angeli. Well, that's why. Yeah. That, well, that's why I asked is, 
is it going to be a, a true battle? You know, how, how many reps is Kenny going to get? I mean, he's there. He's a sophomore. I mean, hell of, hell of a quarterback. Is he going to go out there and battle? Are they going to give him equal reps to go back to Mike's point? We're like, boom, there, there's no doubt when we leave the spring game, April 20th, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. He's number two. That's, that's what, that's what I would love to know. Just like, bam, he's the guy. He beat out Kenny. They gave Kenny a bunch of reps, and and then Jelly was just kicking butt. And he he deserved. Yeah, who, cares, who cares what he did last year against Tennessee State? It's meaningless. Here's what Steve has going for him in that regard, Tim. And again, I, I say this all the time. I feel like on this show, but it's because it's true. You know this as well as anyone. How many reps in a practice is the third string quarterback getting? If if he's not running scout team. Like and and that's a problem in yeah. and of itself. You want him running the Notre Dame offense. He might be running scout team all the time. Last year, for example, Sam Hartman's getting probably sixty to seventy percent of first team reps, and then they funnel twenty to thirty or forty, whatever it is remaining, to Steve Angeli. Kenny Minchie was not getting any solid reps with the Notre Dame offense. He might have been running scout team the whole time, and that's good. That's great. He's getting experience that way, but. When it comes to like, and I get it, it's a new Notre Dame offense with Mike Denbrock, but it's still the same people around him and the same, a lot of the same philosophies, whatnot. Steve Angeli's ahead of Kenny Minchie from that yeah. perspective. He just is. That That's natural. Yeah. And I'll say off of that is that if Angeli got more, because they had to speed him up, because don't forget, Tyler Buckner was getting all those reps. Buckner leaves. So Angeli had to get pushed into that fire to prepare to be the number two ASAP if anything happened with Hartman. That's like, it just keeps going back to Kenny Minty's there. He's a hell of a recruit. We get that CJ Carr is a true freshman. No one wants to throw a true freshman out there whatsoever. Is Minty going to get, and you mentioned it, third string. So if you're saying, well, he's third string, does that mean the choice has already been made? And if the choice has already been made, and then Jelly, is, does that go back to Mike's point of, does that mean Angeli just get it because he's just he played a little last year and Freeman's like, well, he played more, so he's the number two. I would love to know after the spring game, like, no, they went out. I mean, there, there's a few scrimmages where they went at it. They each got 35 snaps, and this is what they did after those 35 snaps in a scrimmage in the stadium. That that would be nice to hear that going out, out of spring. Yeah. Th this, I think – is a huge part about Mike Denbrock being here. Marcus Freeman, everything that I've gathered about him, he is very uh, one guy and then the next in terms of like depth chart setting. He's like, okay, this guy's been here for a while, so he's here. And then this guy's been here a little less time. He, like that's the way his brain works as a 38, 39 year old head coach. He hasn't, he hasn't been through enough of these battles to, to really see it. And he's a defensive side of the ball too. Like that's, that's, he doesn't look at quarterback battles and be like, okay, I, I know a good one when I see him and this freshman is better than that junior. So I'm going to have to bump this guy. I'm going to have to be in the offensive coordinator's ear and, and be like, Hey, I, I think we have this going on. Jared Parker wasn't going to do that to Marcus Freeman either, Tim. He wasn't going to say, Hey, Kenny's better than Steve. So I think we need to start, you know, looking at that. Mike Denbrock, if he sees it and he goes, Hey Marcus, Kenny Kenny Minchie is better than Steve Angeli. Let's let's start working in that progression. What's he got to lose? He's he's 60 years old. He's been at Notre Dame two times before this. He's gonna call it like it is to Marcus Freeman. And and so I, I think that if there's anything going for Kenny Minchie, it's that he has an offensive coordinator that sees it, that knows it. And when when his well, mind gets together with Gino Gadulis, they're gonna say, hey. If Kenny's better, Kenny's better, and let, let's let's get moving on that. Well, this is you know my point. I brought up to, with Mike six months ago, where I you know I said I felt the the battle for number two is the most important position because it sets up 2025. Mm -hmm. So if Marcus Freeman has his mindset of well, I only play the oldest guy, then what the hell is Kenny Minchie d doing? That means he's done. He has no shot, so to speak. Yeah, I'm not throwing words in your mouth. You're just talking about the pecking order. So. If that's the case, yeah. we're in the portal era. What the hell's Kenny doing here then? If if he already knows, because Angeli still has two years. So if if Freeman's truly thinking of a quarterback of the oldest guy's my guy, when does the you know when does the best guy play, so to speak? I guess is is an interesting thing, and that's 
that's, you know, because whoever comes out at number two, I mean, we got to feel that is the best guy to go in for Riley Leonard this year and the best guy to be in this situation 12 months from now. So, and if it is T. Van Jelly and he earned it, awesome. No doubt about that. But how in the world is Kenny Minchie going to get a shot if, if it's not there to get a shot, I guess. So it's going to be interesting out of this spring to see who that number two is because it sets up so much if, if, the big if, Marcus Freeman truly doesn't want to go to the transfer portal era. So, but heck, man, who's to say he doesn't go to it next year, right? His only three quarterbacks are Angeli, Carr, Deuce Knight. Those are the three, you know, so man, we got a long way to go, Tyler. Freaking long way to and go. It, especially uh, the, the last thing I'll say is I wish we had longer to go because that's the only way that you'd ever truly know if Kenny Minchie was better than Steve Angeli. Like if you had 20 practices, 25 as opposed to 15, yeah. I think you could – and I'm not trying to change an NCAA rule or anything. I get it. These guys are student athletes. They have breaks, academic calendars, all of that stuff. But, like, the only way to know is is put these guys in as hot of a fire as you can concoct in a spring practice and, and let them go. And, like, maybe we're we'll already – yeah. yeah, we're already two practices into this thing, and you only have 13 more and – like I, I don't know if that's going to be enough time for Kenny Minchie to unseat Steve Angeli. If this hierarchy thing, I, I think we're on the same page with that, Tim. This hierarchy thing, yeah, that, that's Marcus Freeman's thing, and I, I just don't see a, a way that it doesn't come out of the spring. Riley Leonard one, Steve Angeli two. Like I, I don't see a way. So man, that's fascinating. You see that because if it's a hierarchy thing, and Freeman's here for however long he is. How do, how do the other quarterbacks feel about that, I guess, where they're like, I got to wait till I'm a junior to play? So that's tough in this portal era, especially if Kenny's out there. And he's like, oh, where's, my, where's my shot to be the next guy? So it's a, it's it's an inter, it's an interesting time, obviously, when you think college football, portal era, all that stuff. Do these Notre Dame quarterbacks truly just wait their turn? You know, I mean, we're going to yeah. find out here. I'll probably have to I, yeah, I think all – all it takes is just one instance. And like I said, maybe it's Den Brock saying he's better than him. So let's get him the reps. And if that's Carr being better than Angeli or Minchie being better than Angeli, like all it would take is one time because the other guys will see that and be like, okay, this truly is a meritocracy where if I'm better than the incumbent, I can, I can earn that spot. So, but right now the, the precedent is kind of set to where it's, it's the older guy, the guy with experience. Marcus Freeman loves experience, and and that has shown. Like, just look what he's done with the transfer portal. That has proven to play out that way as long as he's been the head coach. Well, even today, I mean, heck, Stephen Jelly was with the ones today. It was the, as you say, it's the pecking order, right? Boom, that first group came out there. Who was out there with Tosh Baker and Jagatsaw? It was, it was uh, Steve Angeli. So obviously, it's early. Buckner and Hartman rotated, so we'll see how that takes place over the next, you know, month. But um, it's it's fascinating. It, it is the backup quarterback is it's truly a, a, is it a battle? I guess and maybe maybe it's not. Maybe it's just bam. This is the order we're doing it. And if you want to move up, you better be impressive as hell. You know. Or I, I just I don't think it's a battle because I think we've seen as much. It's it's clearly Leonard than Angeli, and, and they're trading in spring. You trade ones like they're going 50 50. and then. Mitchie and Carr are getting the same amount of reps. So, like, if a true freshman can come in and he was he was in high school three months ago and he's playing just as much as Kenny Minchie in these practices, like, it, that tells me one and two is pretty solidified. And then yeah. is the battle th is the battle three, four? It, like, um, that's the way I see it right now. And I don't know. I don't know if people like that, dislike that, but that's the way I see it, man. No, no. I mean, you're there. You're watching it, and and roll from there. They'll be in pads here in the next what couple of days. They'll start putting on some shoulder pads, yep. start hitting each other. So we'll roll from there. But uh, I don't know. If, yeah, Singer's playing Fortnite. Is he chilling? Is he is he okay? <laughs> yeah, there he is. Enjoying the conversation. Um, I'm, I'm here. Thanks, Singer. Thanks, Singer. I mean, I know Ty I've been wanting to chat with Tyler for a while, so this was fun. No, I started. You know, after the show's over, I I still have more to do on you know editing and getting it ready for the front page. So I already wrote the article for the front page from, for this. 
And I wrote, you know what I wrote? I wrote Jordan Faison instead of Dylan Faison four times. (laughs) Uh, It's, it's absolutely absurd, but no, I mean, I, I said my piece, the, uh, the quarterback discussion is interesting. You know, the, the whole, will he get an opportunity kind of thing? It's, it's, it's the same at other positions too. It's not, I mean, it quarterbacks unique, obviously, because you really can only play one, but you know, Tosh Baker sat for four years. I mean, I know he started a little bit here and there, but like he, he waited his time. You know, uh, who who's not to say that it? You know, it, that Steve can't wait his, and and you know maybe he, it's it's him for a little bit, and then it's not probably how it's gonna go. But because uh, quarterbacks, you know, you just have so many transfers, and I think Luce Emoji, um, late great Luce Emoji, his math was. Over a fifty-year period, Notre Dame averaged two, or, or one every two years. It is crazy. Um, so. Crazy the history of quarterback transfers. It just, yeah, it, it just is. But um, it man, I don't know, man. It's it, it it's fascinating because Mike, the whole it's funny because the whole reason Marcus Freeman brought in Riley Leonard because he wanted to make sure he had three quarterbacks in case one transfers. Well, you brought in Riley Leonard. You've almost forced one to transfer. Had you not brought Riley Leonard in, it's Angeli Minchi Carr. Big deal. Yeah, you, so you bring Riley in a Leonard. transfer to improve the ceiling of the room. There's, I mean, that that that's why, you know, that's what he did. So you're saying so? You just said Steve Angeli's not good enough to lead. I I I he said did. you bring in a transfer to improve the ceiling of the room. Did um, Riley Leonard do that? Riley Leonard has a huge ceiling. So Riley Leonard has more talent, more ceiling coming from Duke than the guys in the room. I mean, quarterbacks come from all places, Tim. You know that. Without without a doubt. But in Jelly, Minchie, Carr, those three aren't too bad, right? So is Riley Leonard forcing one of them out when Leonard's only here for a year? You know what I mean? It's a gamble, Tim. You know that. You, yeah, not I, I, heck, it was a gamble last year. Two left, so I feel no. I feel you, yeah. Mike. I do. It's, yeah, Sam Hartman. Yeah, just the it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I am excited to see how he looks at pro day. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure NFL Network will be there. GQ. Um, <laughs> Blue and Gold Illustrated. Blue and Gold Illustrated. <laughs> Speaking right. of that, are you guys are you going there, Tyler? You all the reporters get to go and hang out? Yeah, I'll be there. I will be there. Gotcha, cool. gotcha. All right. Um, well, we're gonna end the show there. Uh did not expect an hour and a half show um and the whole quarterback discussion there. But of, of course, you, you we we're gonna, you know, you, you you get into quarterback, that's that's where it's gonna go. Oh, yeah, um, so I do I I do appreciate Tyler joining the show. Um, Tyler, I know you have a late night tonight. Um, probably shouldn't say that without giving the context. And I don't really know if I'm allowed to. Um, so yeah, <laughs> stop talking. Tyler, 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 has a work re- <laughs> Tyler has a work related function and tonight you'll, you'll, you'll find out tomorrow. I, I don't know. I'm just going to stop talking now, but we are going to end the show there. Um, hit that thumbs up. If you have not done so yet, uh, blueandgold.com is your home for all things Notre Dame fighting Irish football and recruiting coverage. Our offer for you guys, $1 for two months using the promo code UND1. Again, if you're a new subscriber, $1 for two months using the promo code UND1. Signing off the show there, folks. Really appreciate you tuning in. And as always, we will catch you next time.